Well, I'm, uh, I don't know about you guys, but I'm inspired. I think uh, this, this has been a fantastic event and really want to thank you for the opportunity. I, so how many of you guys uh, are ready for the softball, right? I mean, climate change. It's, it's the easiest issue we're taking care of today, I think, right? Healthcare, uh, you've got some of these other pieces as well from education um, and other areas. I, I think that it, it, it's important to start from uh, what actually scales and what actually works within the solution sets we work in. I, my own background, as Saul said, was uh, to start a company called Sun Edison. Uh, I started c caring about climate change and I guess at that point energy back when I was 16 years old. So, you know, we're looking at 2020 to be the goal of the carbon war room. So that would be 30 years ago, basically, that I started thinking about this, right? So from, from 2020 back to 1990. So, um, so it, would, it will have been 30 years when we actually get to 2020. And I think that in that 30 year period of time, um, I got interested in solar, uh, a book that my father bought me that, I, that discussed what nuclear was and coal was and hydro was. And even back then, I think it was pretty obvious to me that, uh, that we were going to go to a distributed form of energy that people would have to self-generate power, that to assume that we were going to put everything in central locations and then come out radially and actually uh, provide people with distribution grids, et cetera, just didn't make sense. Um, and particularly in places like India, where I was born, where, um, in fact, what they do is just to make the numbers look good, they go into villages and they actually um, power one home and say that village is, is is electrified because they don't actually want to bother to put the distribution grid in throughout the entire village because most people use so little electricity it's really not worth the effort right so so so, so you start there right and in 1990 the solar energy community was probably at its lowest point right reagan had shut down the tax credits in the US, J Japan and Germany still hadn't launched their program. So they were sort of in this R&D phase, right? NREL or some of the other, you know, sort of research institutions probably had m money still going in. They probably were selling um, solar panels to satellites and, you know, that was probably the biggest, biggest opportunity. And then around 1992, Japan launched their 100,000 roof program and Germany launched theirs in 1998. And today everyone knows what a feed-in tariff is, which is mind blowing to me. Um, and we just kept going. And what I realized is that, is that you know, I, I started working for Astro Power in the summer of 1995 and then worked at a wind energy company in 1996. And, and what I found was when I talked to people, nobody wanted to pay for 20 years of energy up front. Right? I mean, so, so let's say I, I convinced you now. The spreadsheet, you know, you agree that my spreadsheet isn't doctored, and it's actually a 16% rate of return or 12% rate of return. What do you do? You know, I, I go in front of you and I say, here's, here's the economics. It's $50,000 to put a solar system on your house or $80,000 to put a solar, uh, wind system on your farm. And you say, I've got a kid in private school. Right? I've got to buy a new car. I want to buy a new tractor. So what ends up happening is that corporations do exactly the same thing. They say, the balance sheet that I have, to put it in financial terms, um, basically allows me to have this much capital expenditure per year. And there are, way more thing there are way more important things for me to spend money on than electricity that I'm already getting reliably from the grid. Right? And even when you're pissed, right? So most people today are just pissed at their electric utility company, right? Rates have been going up 5 to 7% a year in the U.S. Since, since 2000. And you've got blackouts, as far as the eye can see, in the D.C. area where I think people have lost like 17 days of electricity this year. And so you start to have this thing where people actually hate the electric utility company and still they can't really move forward. So what we did was we started a, um, we started a financial product uh, at Sun Edison that allowed you to just sign a 20-year contract to buy the power at 10% below what you are currently paying for um, electricity uh, from solar. We put the system on your, on your roof, we actually pay for the whole thing, and we make sure it's maintained, et cetera. The same kind of service you come to expect from your electric utility company. What happened? Solar took off. And today, you know, 90% or so of all solar that gets installed uh, annually, which is around 55 to $60 billion this year, um, will come from a finance solution. Right? And, and, and now, even the most intractable people that I talk to say, yeah, you're right. Solar is actually going to make it. 
It may take until 2020 or so, but solar's actually going to make it. It's going to be self-funding, won't need subsidies, the, the economies of scale are coming down, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to take off. Even the IEA, which is my arch nemesis, my arch nemesis says now that 25% of all primary electricity will come from solar by 2050. So, so you start to see that, that financial products is really the key to infrastructure. Right? Same thing is true with water. Right? We, we heard earlier today in this, in, in, from one of the speakers about, um, um, about how it sparked, I think, about how uh, we got a water well put in um, and, and, and it, it had to bounce over to San Francisco and then back. The challenge with water is actually not, not, not that there is this um, lack of desire to give people access to clean water. The challenge is it's a crap load of money. Right? I mean, it's a crap load of money. How much does it cost to actually solve climate change? From the World Economic Forum to Davos, it says it's $550 billion a year. Right? $550 billion a year. Let's put that in perspective. Um, there's about $125 trillion of private capital. Right? Something on the order of 50% of that is in concentrated hands, like high net worth individuals, sovereign funds, and pension funds. So of that, the pension funds probably hold around $30 trillion. Um, the sovereign funds around $5 trillion, and the balance of that 50% was with high net worth individuals. So it's not a lot of money, right? It's 1%, roughly, a 1% shift. Um, and if you were to say that 10% of all that money annually got shifted, then it's probably something on the order of like, um, you know, 6 to 8% of that money um, that they invest every year to get shifted for any one group. So if they all together decided to do their fair share, it might only be 1% or 2% for each person's annual shift, right? So we actually need to shift 1% or 2% from bad to good. 1% or 2% from bad to good. $550 billion a year. It's a lot of money, right? So, so how successful do you think we're going to be if you basically you know, get together with your neighbors and say, we want to do something together with, with homes, et cetera, and we're going to go to our local community bank and we're going to say, we're going to try to, you know, I, I, I know the board member there and it's great, and so we're going to get loans and we're going to get this done and we're going to put in $500,000 worth of solar on a roof. You're not going to be successful. You're not. I can guarantee you, right? I mean, Sun Edison got... $400 million from Wells Fargo, $100 million from MetLife. We got people from um, you know, the pension funds. We got folks from the insurance industry. All these people in it, and it's still not enough. We're still doing more. The pension funds actually still haven't bought the paper off of the books from Wells Fargo. Because the way finance works is you actually, at the time at which you get um, solar onto the balance sheets of Wells Fargo, they don't want to hold the paper for more than five to seven years. Because they want to take that money back and invest it again. So they actually need someone else to sell it to. Pension funds aren't buying it yet. There isn't a secondary market for solar paper yet, even though it's a 55 to $60 billion a year business. Right? So one of the points of the carbon war room is that individual action is necessary but insufficient. Right? So it's important to note that everyone here buying a Prius isn't going to solve it. Right? And, so, and, I, and I think it's, it's critical because we spend the vast majority of our money on hearts and minds. Right? Let's care about clean water. Let's care, care about the oceans. Let's care about clean air. Well, what, what do we ask you to do about it, though? We ask you to buy you know, products from Method or products from this company or products from that company. It's not, it's not enough. What we need you to do is actually look at the co-benefits that affect you. Right? So that's how investment really changes. So for instance, if you want to build a coal plant in you know, your neck of the woods in Arizona, Coal is, is the, the, the second largest user of fresh water in the United States. It's 1.3 liters of water per kilowatt hour that you use. Right? Hydro is actually worse. Hydro is about four liters per kilowatt hour that you use because of evaporation from the lakes. Um, so the question ultimately is, if you're in a water shortage situation, which the vast majority of Americans and many people around the world are, then why do you allow a coal plant to be built next to your town? It means that another 10,000 homes actually can't be built in your town because there's not enough water for both. Right? It means that you don't actually have, ac and, and on top of that, you're actually paying full price for water, whereas the coal plant is paying practically nothing for water. They subsidize the water to the coal industry. If, they, if the coal industry had to pay the same price that you pay at your home for water, they'd go bankrupt. Right? But we let, we let ourselves do this. And so if you want to do something from an individual perspective, Protest the coal plant locally in your town, right? Get people to, instead of building that new highway and saying, well, you know what? 
we should go from four lanes on both sides to 10 lanes on both sides. That's actually going to work in Atlanta, right? Right? So instead of actually spending billions of dollars on the stupid, actually get involved. Right? And, and don't buy an electric vehicle or a Prius. Get them to actually put in public transit instead of actually expanding the highway. That you can do. There's, a, there's one guy, and I forgot his name, that works for Google, and he lives out of D.C. He started a website the other day and literally, like, is changing the face of urban planning in Washington, D.C. You know, him and, like, you know, 12 of his friends blog, and now they have tons of people reading it, and they put pressure on the city council, and they actually bring sanity to the insanity that is our urban planning process. That will make a difference. You buying a Prius isn't going to make a difference. And the reason it's not going to make a difference is we sell 10 million cars a year, let's say, in the U.S. 100,000 of those vehicles per year are Priuses. 10 million cars bought every year, 100,000 are Priuses. So how many friends are you going to get to buy a Prius? Right? You know, I mean, it's, it's just not going to get there. And it hasn't scaled. In the last four years, the number of people buying Priuses hasn't changed one iota. Like, it scaled pretty fast, and then, like, four years ago, basically... It basically uh, it got, got flat. So the question ultimately comes back to, what actually will get us to change in a massive way? Is it a hearts and minds campaign? I mean, that's working, right? Every generation of children are actually far more green than, the next, than their parents and then their grandparents, right? So that's happening. But that's generations. Every 20 years, we're going to make some difference. What actually works now? And what we found was that greed works now, right? right? And so the fact that I made a ton of money on Sun Edison, people are like, Fantastic, I want to do what that guy did, right? So there's like 150 other companies around the world that, are, that want to copy what I did, and so we've got companies doing um, solar services in India, we've got companies in Bahamas, we've got companies in Jamaica, and they all basically downloaded the business plan case competition that we won and said, hey, we're going to copy that thing. And I get emails from them on LinkedIn and said, hey, Jigger, can you help me? And I'm like, of course. I mean, in fact, this problem is so massive that we need 10,000 companies to do the same thing. Right? And so this is, this is fantastic. And you know, so I go back and, you know, to what you know, um, Michael Douglas said and said, greed is good. And I think we should actually embrace that. And it's a big problem, right? Because we're spending, let's, let's say, something on the order of a billion dollars in the last two years on this, you know, getting a climate bill in the U.S. and Copenhagen and trying to figure out a way to tax the Australian mining industry. And they all didn't work, right? They didn't work. And the reason for that is because people fundamentally believe that today the solutions that we're trying to push on them is, one, not their problem, because they don't want to spend money off their own balance sheet to actually make a difference. I was talking to somebody within the Obama administration who was on the National Economic Council, and I said, Jigger, you got to explain this to me. Why should I invest in energy efficiency? And I said, because you know, it's cost effective and you don't have to use debt from the U.S. balance sheet and move this forward. Yeah, but I, why do we have to get involved? It's a 20% rate of return. I said, well, why aren't you doing it on your own house? Your president actually gave you, or our president basically gave, you know, you a 30% tax credit to do it in your own home. It's a 25% rate of return to, to do your, you know, insulation, et cetera. He's like, well, I got a kid in private school. I was like, so Walmart has a kid in private school too. You know, I mean, that's, that's the way it is, right? And people say to me, but Jigger, no, they've got so much money. No, they don't. That money is always more valuable to them on buying another company in Brazil, trying to figure out a way to make their stores a lot cleaner and the lighting better. Whatever it is that they want to do, it's more important than actually saving the world from climate change. Right? So I think it's critically important for us to change the frame of the way we think about this. So ultimately, we're a global nonprofit, independent, that actually wants to catalyze climate wealth creating opportunities to save the planet. And it, and it exists everywhere. McKinsey, Booz Allen, all these people have actually said that 50% of carbon emissions in the world today have a profitable way to offset it, right? Automobiles that actually are more efficient because they use lighter weight materials that happen to be safer for your kids and your family, right? Things like building energy efficiency that actually has, you know, two to three year paybacks. So what do we need to do? We need to do something similar to what we did at Sun Edison. You've got to create off balance sheet financial products for all of these guys to invest in. People will sign up 10 year pay as you save contracts for their buildings if you'll upgrade the building because it actually makes the building more comfortable. It makes it cheaper to, to live in because the, uh, the socialized cost of the building actually are cheaper than, than it would be if, if, if it was a profligate energy user. So it actually makes things more competitive and people would do it if they had an off-balance sheet product. But if it's non-balance sheet product, then they make choices with that money. 
right? So it's critical for us to have that. In the shipping industry, for instance, um, the IMO, right, the International Maritime Organization, has said that 70% of all bunker fuel that gets burned actually can be cost-effectively offset with today's technologies with a two-year payback. So we're creating financial products in the shipping industry and, and, information and solving information asymmetry. So I think that if, if you take anything away from, from what I'm saying here is that we need your help. We can solve climate change. We can do it, but stop bothering with the stuff that isn't going to solve the problem, not in the next five to 10 years. What's going to solve the problem is that we actually get involved locally, fix the way that we invest in infrastructure, and create financial products that actually allow people to take part in the solution without using their balance sheet. Thank you.